I have to start this morning with a confession. Uh, Last week we began a new little series of messages uh, dealing with our speech. I've called it uh, Taming the Tongue. And I said we would be continuing the series in our service today, but it turns out that was false advertising and uh, I I apologise. I had planned to preach on the sin of gossip this morning, so maybe you're happy that I've had a change of plans. (laughs) And uh, I spent most of uh, Monday outlining the sermon and writing the introduction. But then for a number of reasons, my heart and my mind were drawn to a particular text of scripture and to an altogether different message. And I believe it's the one the Lord would have me bring to you today. So uh, God willing, I'll bring that sermon on the sin of gossip next Lord's Day. Uh, It's an uncomfortable subject for sure. Uh, But please still show up. Don't suddenly decide that your sock drawer desperately needs to be reorganised. Okay? Still, still come to church. We all need to hear what the Word of God says about that very serious issue. For today, we're going to consider a familiar passage in the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. So please, if you would, open your Bibles there and we'll read the text. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5. I'll give you a moment to uh, find that. Once more, it's the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5. And please follow along as I read aloud, beginning at verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadareans. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, verse 3, who had his dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because of that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. The unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that, that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, bow before you now, and our greatest need is to hear from you today. We pray that uh, it would be your voice, your word, that is heard very clearly in our midst. Uh, We need to see your Son. I pray that you would show him to us today. Uh, Please encourage us, please help us. Uh, Give us grace to concentrate. We commit this time of preaching into your uh, very safe and loving hands. 
These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to begin by telling you what I'm not going to talk about in this sermon. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to enter into an in-depth discussion of demons and demon possession. Okay, this passage gives us some very plausible insight into that subject, uh, but that's not our focus today. Uh, the key point for our purpose this morning is that demons, uh, unclean spirits, were the cause of this man's trouble. Okay, he was a troubled soul because of the presence and the influence of evil spirits. Okay? They had taken up residence inside him. I'm not going to try to explain how or why this was so. That's a subject for another day. And if you have questions about that, please come and ask me after the service. What I do want to reflect on is just how troubled this man was. The description of his tormented existence is heartbreaking. Let's consider some of the details as Mark gives them to us, probably based on the Apostle Peter's recollections, who was there, who witnessed all of this. Jesus had travelled across the Sea of Galilee from the western side to the eastern side to the land of the Gadareans. Probably so that he might have some rest, some time away from the crowds who he had been ministering to. We're told that as soon as Jesus stepped out of the boat, he was met by this man. In verse 6 it says he ran to Jesus. So I think we can surmise that as soon as the boat landed, this man ran towards it perhaps down the hillside to the shore. Can you picture him? Naked, shrieking, filthy, his body covered in scars and sores. Can you imagine him running straight towards our Lord? I don't think Jesus was afraid, but I dare say most of us would have been to suddenly be accosted by this obviously very disturbed individual. And that would have been pretty scary. Mark tells us in verse 3 that he was homeless. and He lived among the tombs, probably caves in the hills outside the town where the dead were buried. Uh, don't think of someone you know, sleeping among the headstones down at the cemetery in East Lismore. Think of someone sleeping in a cave next to the bodies and bones of who knows how many people. Had this man been ostracised by the community that he grew up in, by his family and his kinsmen, because of his severe mental illness, uh, because his behaviour was so abnormal and so unsettling, had he been driven out by the townspeople because they didn't want him around? Was there nowhere else for him to find shelter except among the tombs? Or was this where he chose to live? He chose to live on the margins, outside the bounds of normal society because he couldn't bear the stigma and the reproach. We don't know. Clearly there were people in authority who considered him to be a danger to the community and a danger to himself because they had tried many times unsuccessfully to secure him. Verses 3 and 4 describe something like the first century version of the straitjacket and the padded cell. It says, who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. For me, the saddest part of the description is in verse 5. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. What pain this man was in. Unending pain. Always, the text says. 
always, night and day, crying. Not crying, but crying out, shrieking, screaming, and cutting himself, making himself bleed with sharp stones. In a perverse way, people who cut themselves do so in order to experience relief as a way to cope with anxiety or despair or anger or sorrow or guilt. Uh, they hurt themselves in order to feel better. You know, the pain in their flesh relieves the pain in their soul or at least temporarily distracts from it. It's totally twisted and it's so sad. That's what this man was doing, night and day. He was in anguish. He was tormented. His insanity wasn't a pleasant delusion. He wasn't living out a wonderful fantasy where he was someone special or endowed with special knowledge or divine power. It wasn't that kind of break with reality, no. This insanity, his insanity, was torturous. It was dark. It was hellish. What the demons had done to his mind had robbed him of his home, his relationships, his health and his dignity. We might say they robbed him of his humanity. Uh, there wasn't much left. But thankfully, the best thing that could have happened to him did happen. He met Jesus. In fact, I think we can say that Jesus travelled across the lake into what was a predominantly Gentile area in order to meet him. Okay, this wasn't a surprise to Jesus. Uh, this wasn't an accidental encounter. Jesus knew this man would meet him when he stepped off the boat. When I read this, it doesn't appear to me that this very disturbed person came to Jesus begging to be delivered. And that's not how the story unfolds. It's not like some of the other instances in the Gospels where someone came to Jesus and asked for healing for themselves or for a loved one. No. I tend to think this poor man was so far gone, so oppressed by the evil, so far removed from sanity that he couldn't have asked to be delivered, even if he wanted to. It uh, might have been his voice in verses 7 to 12, but it wasn't him who was speaking, it was the unclean spirit. It seems to me that Jesus took the initiative. And when, he, when he met this man, he commanded the demons to leave him. It was an act of grace. It was an act of unmerited favour and kindness, an act of compassion and love. And the demons knew who Jesus was. Hey, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? <laughs> they knew who Jesus was. Their confession was exactly right. The devils believe there is a God. They know that Jesus is the Son of God. And James tells us that they tremble. They shudder in terror when confronted by him. These devils knew they had no choice. They knew they were going to have to obey Jesus' command. So they, as it were, negotiated with him. And when we read this text alongside the account in Matthew and Luke, it's clear that these evil spirits were begging Jesus not to finally judge them and send them into everlasting perdition. They were begging for a stay of execution, if you will. Please don't send us to hell. Instead, send us into the swine, <laughs> that we may enter into them. And Jesus did. The evil spirits departed from the man and entered into the swine. Now I think verse 15 is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. 
See if you can see if you can picture it. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. There he was, still, calm, at peace, with clothes on and in control of his faculties. That's the idea. No longer in pain, no longer tormented, no longer crying and shrieking, no longer cutting his flesh to try to get some relief, but safe and sane and whole and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And what does he want to do? He wants to be with Jesus. And why wouldn't he? Verse 18, when he, that's Jesus, was come into the ship, so he's heading back across the lake, when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. It's beautiful. Now, as I said a moment ago, this text gives us some very important insights into the nature of demons and demon possession and we could think about that at some length and that would be profitable, but I want us to consider this story in a different way and that will lead us into the one point that I want to make this morning. Okay, this is a one point sermon. It's stating the obvious to say that this man was deeply troubled. Uh, if uh, we were to locate this man's condition on a spectrum, uh, it would be right at the far end. Okay, extremely troubled. The anguish in his soul had driven him to the margins of society and to lose control of his faculties. Were he alive today, he would probably be in the most secure part of a mental hospital for his own safety and for the safety of the community. This man's experience was at the extreme end. And maybe you know something about this. Uh, maybe you've had some very painful and distressing seasons in your life where you needed treatment and care for a a severe mental illness. Uh, can Christians get to a place where they need that kind of care? They sure can. And uh, there's no shame in it. We are fallen human beings living in a fallen world. Uh, you've probably heard of the great English pastor and author Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was probably the finest preacher in the English language ever. Certainly one of the most influential but maybe you didn't know that he had a lifelong battle with depression. There were times when his depression was so bad that he had to take extended breaks from his ministry to rest and recover. So yes, we might be Christians, but we're still fallen human beings living in a fallen world and we can suffer in this way. But maybe we haven't been through something like that, but we've all experienced things you know, further along the spectrum, less extreme, but still very difficult. Uh, things like the grief and the pain associated with loss, uh, losing a loved one, losing a relationship, losing an opportunity. Uh, that can be so upsetting, so troubling. Or we've experienced debilitating anxiety and incessant and inescapable worry about everything. We can't seem to switch our brain off. We come to what should be normal, routine, everyday social settings and we feel sick. Or we've experienced a season of deep discouragement or of great disappointment and hurt. Uh, there are many things in this life that can cause us to have and to be a troubled soul, like this man was. Maybe it's simply the accumulation of all the little stresses and the little worries of everyday life. Being a mum, being a dad, uh, caring for someone who is elderly or unwell. Sometimes that's enough to trouble us inwardly. But here's the point. This story in Mark chapter 5 is mainly about one thing. It's about power. 
Jesus' power. And it's so very simple, and we must not miss it. What we see here is that Jesus' power was greater than what was troubling this poor man. And what was doing the troubling knew it. The unclean spirits knew it. They knew they had come face to face with the very Son of God. They were acutely aware that their fate was entirely in his hands. Jesus could deliver this man because he was more powerful than the thing that was distressing him. And by his superior power, he set this man free, he healed his soul, he restored his sanity, he made him whole and gave him peace. And again, this is so simple. This is something we know about our Lord, but it's something we need to be reminded of, something we need to lay hold of. Uh, Jesus' power is greater than whatever it is that troubles us. For sure, we have some difficult situations to deal with. Oh yes, we have some problems. Maybe big problems. We have issues that complicate our lives and drag us down. There are things that make us sad and cause us to worry. But our Saviour's power is greater than them all. If there's something upsetting you today or discouraging you or making you anxious, Jesus is greater. His power is greater. Now, if you have doubts about this, and you probably don't, but if you do, think about the, the thing that troubles people the most. And I mean generally, out, out there in the world. Think about the thing that troubles people the most, and then think about what happens at the end of this gospel. I'll read some verses from the end. You can turn there if you like or just listen. Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. It says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Verse 3. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door <coughs> Excuse me, of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. If anything bears witness to the power of Jesus, it's this. It's the empty tomb. He is so mighty, so strong, so capable that he could predict and then perform his own resurrection. He laid down his life. He voluntarily went to the cross. His blood was shed. His body was broken. He died. And then he took up his life again. He arose from the dead. He walked out of that tomb. He overcame, he overpowered that which troubles people more than anything else. He didn't just have power over diseases and over demons, but over death. Our greatest affliction, our biggest problem. Now there is a wonderful verse in the book of Hebrews about this. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, I'll read from verse 14. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that is God the Son, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He partook of flesh and blood. God the Son became a man, a real human person, that through death, through the cross, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And then listen to the next part. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
Through his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ has delivered us from that crippling, debilitating, life-dominating, soul-crushing fear, the awful dread of death. As I said, he overcame, he overpowered that which troubles people more than anything else. And for we who know Christ, who are in Christ, we are able to say, along with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, is his power greater than whatever it is you're dealing with? It sure is. If you ever doubt that, remember that the tomb is empty. That's how great his power is. And if you ever doubt that he is for you, that he loves you and is using his great power to protect you and to carry you through this veil of tears, then remember his cross. Remember those bleeding wounds in his hands and in his feet. They were for you because he loves you and wanted to save you from death and judgment and hell because he wanted to make you clean and safe forever. Because he wanted to reconcile you to himself and to his Father. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Saviour and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. May God bless you, my dear brothers and sisters, and may he bless the preaching of his precious word. Amen.